Welcome back to Your Health Television Program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm very pleased you could be with us for this next segment. I will talk about the natural neck lift, especially for men. Uh, as you know, I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and one of my most frequent requests that I see in the office is someone who wants to improve their facial appearance or their neck appearance, and they would like to have some rejuvenation. I oftentimes will, will have people come in and they say that in the past few years they've noticed that their neck looks a little saggy or sometimes they'll grab the tissue underneath the chin and say I have this turkey gobbler neck or turkey neck or loose skin. What are these folds? And sometimes that will be in combination with the jowls. Sometimes, sometimes that will be in combination with the face, etc. So it's one of the most common requests that I see and hear about in my office is rejuvenation or requesting plastic surgery or modification of the face and neck. I, I intend to talk a lot about natural neck rejuvenation for men, uh, primarily because men come into my office, a lot of men come into my office, sometimes asking for a facelift or what can be done. And I would say that more men that I see need a neck lift, a neck and jowl lift, as opposed to simply a facelift. Now again, a facelift can be done in combination with a neck lift, neck and jowl lift, or it can, or it can be done separately. Uh, we do not have to do the neck lift. I think we have reached a point in plastic surgery, modern plastic surgery, where we can address primarily the area that concerns a patient, whether it's a man or a woman. It's not necessarily true that we have to do the face to do the neck. We don't have to do the neck to do the face but a person can describe to me, demonstrate to me when looking in a mirror or, or by bringing in photographs, precisely the area or areas that they want to treat. So again, I think in men, I do more neck and jowl lifts than I do facelifts in men. But pr I think for women, it's about equal. I do as many facelifts and neck lifts, facelifts as neck lifts for women, and sometimes those are done in combination or sometimes they're done separately. But in any case, in both genders, for both men and, men and women, I think a crisp, clean uh, neckline and jawline is really desirable. I think for men, it's a sign of masculinity and youthfulness and a vibrant appearance. And for women as well, it's a very beautiful area of the, of the anatomy that I think in general, a clean, crisp neckline is desirable for both men and for women. So how do we go about talking about improving the neck and jawline in both, uh, in either a man or a woman? First of all, I'm a big believer in custom designed approaches. I think it's very important to sit down with an experienced board certified plastic surgeon who has experience and skill in this area, as opposed to perhaps going somewhere where you get in line and everyone gets the same approach. There are certain magic lifts or this lift or that lift where it's a certain template approach, kind of a cookie cutter approach. I'm not a big believer in that. I think that every person, every patient, customer, client deserves a custom designed approach by a, by a board certified plastic surgeon who's experienced in this area. So how do I start this out? In my office in consultation, I like to look at a photograph of a person or we look in the mirror together, and I ask the person to point out to me or describe what they might want to change. We're fortunate enough uh, on the Monterey Peninsula, I'm here in Monterey, I do have a new photographic computer device called the Vectra. It's a six camera photo imaging system that is connected through a fairly, fairly complicated software system in a computer where someone can actually view their face their body, their breasts, a certain body part in three dimensions. And we can sit there together and actually rotate their face, rotate their body, and look at their structures, look at their anatomy from different angles. And then together, a person can point out what they might want to change. We can actually do some sculpting, some reshaping um, through the software. And I find it to be a great teaching tool and a great tool for a person to communicate with me what they might want to change. That's called the Vectra. It's a six camera photo computer imaging system and it's in my office here in Monterey. So we start off by imaging. 
We start off by examining the patient, and more important than what I think a person needs, I want to hear what a person would like to change themselves. I'm certainly happy to give a person my impression to tell a patient what I think can be done safely and effectively. Of course, I'm happy to do that. But I like to start off a consultation by hearing what a person wants to accomplish, what part of their body do they want to change or improve. Now, once we hear about that, I think it's, it's important to remember that effective, high-quality surgery starts out with accurate knowledge of, knowledge of the anatomy. And for the neck and jawline, I go through step by step. We need to look at the skin. We, look, we need to look at the subcutaneous fatty layer. When I say subcutaneous, that's the layer of fat under the skin that's above the muscle. So we look at the skin, we examine the fatty layer, then I get to the muscle layer. Now some of you, perhaps more likely those from Carmel Valley or who visit Carmel Valley, you know about horses. The reason I bring up horses is because there's a muscle called the platysma that runs from the very large jawbone, the mandible of the horse, about three quarters of the way down the body. And that muscle in the horse is responsible for shivering. Well, we also have a platysma muscle, but it's vestigial. What I mean by vestigial is it's like the appendix. It, it has really lost its function, and it runs, runs from our mandible, our jaw, but it stops at the clavicles. So it really has no other function in, in our species other than to provide plastic surgeons with work. So I look at the skin, I look at the, examine the fatty layer, we need to examine that platysma muscle, and then we need to have a look at some deeper structures and the chin itself, the jaw itself. Sometimes I look at the subplatysmal fat, that fatty layer or, or the area under the platysma muscle that can accumulate fat. On occasion I will look at I will certainly examine the submandibular glands, the glands underneath the jaw that help us to make saliva. But the point is, is that we need to go step by step analyzing the anatomy and addressing just what the patient needs to have addressed. Again, not everyone gets the same operation. It's not, it's not a cookie cutter approach, custom designed approach. So let's back up a little bit. What I ask a person to do is to point out to me what part of their anatomy they want to change, what is it that they want to improve. Sometimes people will come in and they'll grab underneath their chin or their neck and they'll say, I want to take care of this turkey gobbler. Can you, can't you just cut away all this extra skin? Well, it may be extra skin, but it may be fat. It may have a fatty component, or it could be the loose platysma, platysma muscle. So we need to go through step by step. If someone has a lax or loose platysma, I will more likely than not recommend a platysmaplasty, and I'll get to that later, but that's when we firm up, tighten up, transpose the platysma muscle. So let's go back to the beginning. I say we look at the skin, fatty layer, platysma muscle, sometimes the structures underneath the platysma muscle, and I look at the chin and jaw itself. So if a person has good, resilient skin, and not a lot of extra skin, but they have redundant fatty layer, sometimes a person will do very well with just liposuction. Now the kind of liposuction that I do is a variation of what I call micro liposculpture. It's more than just sticking in a tube or cannula and attaching to a vacuum. What I do for liposuction, li micro liposculpture of the neck and chin area, I make three very small incisions, quite small, to get in a cannula. A cannula is a tube. Sometimes they're just a little bit thicker than a needle or a little bit wider than a needle. I make one very small incision under the chin in the submental crease. Most Americans that I meet in the office already have a scar there because they tell me they fell off a curb or they tripped on the stairs or they fell from their from a bike or they got into a fight with their little brother, etc. So most people already have a little scar underneath the chin in the submental crease that I can use. Then I make another little incision where the earlobe meets the cheek on each side. And through those three small incisions, I insert a tube, a fine tube called a cannula, which then I can attach to a vacuum to do liposuction. And while I'm doing that, 
I can mold and shape and tailor. Because, of course, we want to have a properly uh, sculpted and properly defined neck and jawline and submental area when we do liposuction. That's good for people with relatively resilient skin who have redundant fat. Now, what about people who have extra skin or loose skin? Now, keep in mind that as we grow older, we, we th perhaps think that we have extra skin there, but it's really not true that we've grown extra skin, but the skin that is there maybe has come down or descended from the face or the jawline, and it's lost its resilience. So at that point, when a person has extra skin or skin that has lost its resilience, recommending liposuction alone probably will not result in a high percentage of delighted patients. And that's what we want, right? We want a high percentage of delighted patients. So if a person has skin that has lost its resilience, if there's some redundant skin, I will oftentimes recommend that we firm up the skin, uh, transpose the skin, move it back to a higher position. Um, so I'll have to make longer incisions. Now, everyone is focused or everyone wants to have scars that are as short as possible. We can do a lot more work these days through shorter incisions than we, than we have been able to in the past. That's probably because a lot of the work that I do will just be on the deeper structures and I won't have to take out a lot of skin as long as I can affect the, the position of the deeper structures. So I talked about the fatty layer, I've talked about the skin now, and I mentioned briefly the platysma. If someone has a very lax platysma muscle, they will likely need a platysmoplasty. A platysmoplasty is a process where I affect the tone and position of the platysma muscle, oftentimes firming it up, transposing it, tightening it to improve the submental area, the neck and jawline. That's, again, that's called a platysmoplasty. Typically, I make an incision in the submental crease longer than I, need, than I can make to just perform liposuction because to do the liposuction, I have to insert a very fine cannula, but if I'm going to actually operate on the platysma muscle and tighten it up and firm it, sometimes put in sutures, that will have to be a longer incision. Oftentimes, I'll do that in combination with an incision in the back of the ear sometimes in the crease, in the front of the ear, and that way I can elevate the jowls as well. I think oftentimes I will uh, elevate or improve the jowls, the sort of redundant tissue around the jaw, as opposed to just affecting the platysma muscle in the neck. Now I mentioned looking at the deeper structures. Sometimes we'll need to affect the fatty layer that's deep as the platysma. On rare occasion, if someone has very prominent submandibular glands, I'm willing to discuss the prominent glands underneath the jaw. What I would like to mention, of course, is that one other imp another important component to neck and jaw, re jaw re rejuvenation is the chin itself. And there are two common ways that we improve the contour of the chin. One is with the use of a chin implant that we can put in through an incision, again, in the submental crease sometimes through an incision on the inside of the lip, inside the mouth, or there's also a procedure called a bony, ge bony genioplasty, where if a man, particularly a man, on occasion a woman, will have sort of a retrusive chin or a weak chin, we can bring the chin forward itself, oftentimes creating a much more pleasing silhouette, sculpting and bringing the chin forward to where it belongs. So again, to review, Custom designed approach serves my patients, my clients, and my customers very well, much better than a, an approach where everyone gets the same approach, everyone gets the same sort of template procedure. This is not a cookie cutter operation. Custom designed approach for the natural neck rejuvenation, whether it's a man or a woman. If you'd like more information on the natural neck lift, whether you're a man or a woman, or any other procedure in plastic surgery, I'm Dr. David Morwood. My website is drmorwood.com, D-R-M-O-R-W-O-O-D. That's drmorwood.com. I'm in Monterey. My phone number is 831-646-8661. That's 831-646-8661. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon. This is your health. 
television program. Thanks so very much for being here today. I hope you come by again.